going to have a conversation with my friend Helen as we uh, speak into that theme. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Helen, <clears throat> more than I was able to say. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Is it good afternoon already? Yes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Helen Grace Namuluana. Um, I, I am a mother. One of the greatest ministries that I've had to serve in yeah. is the ministry of being a parent. I am a practitioner in the social work and social sciences field. I'm a counselor. Um, I've worked quite a bit with the sector of children and families over the last 21 years, actually. Wow. This year is 21 years. So, yeah, I have worked quite a bit in that sector. I bless the Lord for the opportunity that he has given me to serve in different capacities, in different labels of the vineyard that he has placed before me um, in providing services to disadvantaged, disadvantaged persons, children and adults all alike. Um, may I say some more about my work? Yes. yes, so as I talk about my work, I just want to sound a few things. Number one is that our sector, the children and uh, family sector, is one of the most crucial, crucial sectors that on which any nation is founded, and yet one of the sectors that leaves a lot to be desired for most of the people in our country. So as fellow Christians, as we go about our business, whether you're still a student or someone serving in a different capacity, be mindful of the people that are around you, the children that are around you, the young people that are around you, because they are younger people than you, uh, the adolescents. It is important that we reach out to those people, whichever way we can. It might not be material. For many, it's just someone to talk to. For many, it's someone to just look up to. There are so many people that look up to us and we don't even know that they look up to us as role models. We don't know their names. We probably don't even know their faces. But they will tell someone who will tell someone that my role model is this lady so it, or this gentleman. So it matters how we carry ourselves, how we address ourselves, how we dress up. Everything we say basically matters. Two... Around our sector, it's also the sector where we find the most vulnerable persons, especially the children. You know that 56% um, of our population is children, and that should be very telling about the kind of country that we have. We have a young country, and the vulnerability among the children keeps skyrocketing every day. From where I sit, I see millions and millions of children that have been exposed to one or even more forms of abuse. And uh, it doesn't matter whether they are poor or children living in Kololo or children living in Muyenga, they all suffer abuse. And it's just that the manifestations might be different. So as you go about your business, be mindful of those things as well. Right now, we're dealing with a problem of uh, a baby boom. Mm. Uh, since the onset of COVID, I think we will be getting, you know, roughly about 1.5 to 2 million newborns from March 2020 to date, and some are yet to be born. So it's serious stuff that we're talking about. Some have been, you know, coerced into sex. Some have been, you know lied to and eventually gotten their consent and they have had sex, quote-unquote, willingly. Others have been given away by their own parents in exchange for basics like food and, you know, shelter and these things. So this is the kind of country where we are. And it's not all gloom, let me just say that. Despite all of these things that are happening, it's not all gloom. There are also good things that are happening here led by the state itself, the government of Uganda, but they need more hands and feet to keep these messages going down to everybody to be able to influence and cause change in their circles of influence. Can I stop there? Ah, you're so passionate, Helen. I am. 
tell us about your journey with Jesus and the difference Jesus has made to you. So I, I accepted the Lord in um, my many years ago, 1990 through 1992. 1992, we were still young people, and since then we have served, I have served together with colleagues in different spaces uh, in the mainstream church, and I dare to say that a lot of what I am today is really founded on the decision I made then, and of course the nurturing that I was exposed to along the way, because you see it's one thing to plant a seed, it's another for someone else to nurture it and then have some fruit uh, come out of it. So with regards to how the Lord has influenced me, I'll just share two, three things. Number one, in the th that he has influenced me in terms of the things that I believe as a person, the values that I uphold as a person. I have worked in a sector where we deal with lots and lots and lots of money, lots and I'm speaking 200 billion shillings, 150 billion shillings, which is not everyday money, but that if you aren't grounded uh, early in the issues of integrity, in issues of uh, knowing that whatever you do uh, directly speaks to other people that know you as a Christian, it's very easy for you to sway. Um, I've been entrusted with big monies because I've, you know, I've used to manage like big regions from the east, from Karamoja all the way to West Nile and down south. So you move with, say, 100 million. And I'm just giving an example of the, the war times. There were no banks running. And uh, during the time of the LRA, we used to move with money, lots of money. And, you know, if you took 20 million shillings, nobody would even recognize that. Uh, because, you know, there are expenses. People don't have receipts to account for things. But the way that the walk with God, with Jesus, impacted me was that I can confidently stand and say that I have not deprived any Ugandan child or any Ugandan adult of any shilling or have a shilling. And that's a testimony that I believe everybody that I have worked with can share. And... I, I pride in that, but it's also very humbling. And maybe the other thing is about issues of uh, managing people and relating with people. Because Jesus was a person who loved people. And it didn't matter whether they were the gate man or a tea girl or, you know, a child who's a stepchild in the family. He loved us all. And that has impacted me in the way I relate with people, especially the people that other people tend to look down upon in the spaces of work. And I think that that is very encouraging. You encourage people, go and, you know, upgrade. You came here as a driver. Go and improve. Learn how to turn on a computer. Sometimes they don't like the things that you tell them to do. But later on in life, they realize that it was for a good reason. And I really thank God that that's a gift that I have been blessed with to be able to look out for those specific people. Yeah. Thank you so much. When you talked about 200 billion shillings, <laughs> I remembered we are going to build a chapel soon and whether your people tithe. Yes. So it will be good to get a tithe of 20 billion <laughs> to our chapel. Oh, yeah. But we shall keep praying. Um, what was, do you have an incident in life, Helen? When you have come face to face with death, mm -hmm. what was that like? How did that speak to you? So this year, during the second wave of COVID-19, I got infected with COVID. And I live with just my son, that guy there attending class at the back. It's just the two of us in, in the house. And we both fell sick at the same time. And... Uh, for him, uh, he got up, I think, up to, after about maybe seven days. And you know, when your child is sick, you don't feel the seriousness of your own sickness at the time because you're paying attention to your child. But as soon as he started asking, Mommy, can I go out and play with my friends? The day he said that, I actually fell, I felt really sick. I think that's when everything just pressed in on my body and... 
I felt the breathing issues that we had been told about the difficulties and I remember spending a whole consistent seven nights sleeping in this position like this, like sitting up the whole night and if I doze off, I doze off. If I don't doze off, I'm seated the whole night. And it was one of those things that made me really think about, okay, this could be it. My journey could have come to an end. My purpose here uh, could, you know, I could be in the very evening days of my life. And how did it impact me is that the things I considered then as very important ceased to matter. Like there was nothing more important to me than life itself. The fact that you're able to wake up and your son gives you a hug and says good morning, that became precious. The fact that you're able to pick up the phone without struggling. I could hear my phone ring, but I didn't have the energy to reach out for it. And I didn't want to scare my son. And no one was allowed to come to our house because we were infected. Um, so you would leave it to ring until you gather some energy. So the fact that you can't even reach out to your phone and call your parents to say, Hi, hello, daddy, how are you? How is mommy? Things like that. It sort of changed, uh, changed my perspective about the things that are very important in life. And I think that for me, apart from life itself, the social connections are very important. Um, the, the families that God has blessed us with are very important. But also, it is very important to be aware that actually this end could come anytime. That you don't have to start thinking about it when you clock 80, that it could drop today. I don't think the late Badagawa, with all of everything he had at his disposal, even thought that he could be, you know, deceased the way he is now. So it, called, it got me thinking about life, preparing for life, life's end, my life's end, but also further reflecting on how my life after here would be for me, but also for the people that I leave behind. Yeah. Thank you, Helen. Helen, you have been in church for a long time. Yes. Have you ever been to a church where they did a series of six Sundays on death? <laughs> well, yes, I saw. Uh, I wasn't there personally, but I could see, um, you know, like many churches, you know, online, you keep changing from channel to channel and everybody is talking about death. I did witness that. At least four Sundays, consecutive Sundays, and people are talking about death. But the approach was more to do with, okay, guys, you could actually die any minute, but where, where are you going? Something more about instilling fear um, rather than saying, guys, we can beat this even in death we still remain conquerors as the word tells us that even in death we win because we are in Christ Jesus. So I saw a bit of that lacking. For some, yes, it came out, but for others, it didn't come out. Yeah. You see where I was going with that question, Helen, is that many times you're reminded of death only at a funeral service. Right. And then after that, we forget about it or we avoid it altogether. Right. Why do you think that is the situation? <laughs> I really think that that happens because we are more inclined to fearing as humans rather than raising our faith. I think it's more natural for us to be scared about something, even if we just imagined it, than it is for us to actually say, no, even if it happened, we can overcome. So the whole thing about false expectations appearing real, I think is a real thing as opposed to, uh, it's a natural, almost a natural thing, as opposed to saying, no, we can't. We, he overcame, we shall overcome, because we are in Christ Jesus, you know, that kind of thinking. I had you uh, do a small presentation. Yes. On the things I need to prepare as Paul Waswa. Yes. So that if I'm gone, I would have put my house in order. Right. Can you walk us through some of those things you thought through during that tough time and uh, mm -hmm. which could be helpful for us as we lay a firm foundation for after we are gone? Right. 
So after I was down with COVID, after that phase, I did share with friends on social media about my personal reflections. And one of those, I think there were about three or four, one of those was the need for us to align vertically, but also horizontally. And in aligning vertically, it's you know about making sure that we are right with our maker, uh, because when all, said, when all is said and done, that's where we return. And like I shared earlier, I realized that during that period, you know it's one thing to say it, but when you come face to face with you know, near death, it's a whole different experience. During that period, I realized that indeed, it is important for us to keep connected to God, for we don't know the time when this whole thing will come to an end. So to keep aligned with our creator, to keep aligned vertically, is important, but also to keep aligned horizontally. And by that, I meant keeping aligned and in touch with the people that God has placed around us. So if it's your wife, if it's your husband, if it's your parents, if it's your siblings, keep aligned, keep in touch, keep a connection. I realized that um, one of the difficulties that many people that suffered from COVID experienced, what made the situation even worse, was the fact that the social connection was cut off. So even when you needed someone to talk to, you didn't have anybody. Everybody would, you know, someone would slide the food to you in the bedroom and walk off, you know. And even the doctors would make it clear, no contact, wear two masks. If you're more than two people at home, make sure you're masked up the whole time so there's no connection. And so the importance of the horizontal connection <coughs> became even more important to me. But also number three was uh, the issue around preparing our loved ones for when we are gone. Preparing our loved ones for that moment when we are gone. Like I said, uh, there's no, nobody knows the time, nobody knows the place. But how we equip our children, how we equip our spouses, how we have these conversations with our parents is absolutely important. I remember I had to have this conversation with my parents. And I, I told them I'll be sending you a list of things that I think that you're going to need to keep very safely. I hadn't yet told them that I actually had COVID because my parents are both hypertensive, so I didn't want to escalate an already bad problem. So I told them I'll send you a list of things that I think you'll need to hold on to. It might come in handy at some point. So my mother, I think, sensed it. So she said, but you've been unwell. Is everything okay? So I said, oh, mommy, I, I don't feel well, very well, but I really feel the need to share this with you. And on the list was all of my little belongings, the things I had acquired over time. And I said, I stand, you know, I, the only child you know is the only child I have. The, the people that you know in my life are the people that, you know, uh, the people that have been, you know, ministers to me, you know, because they know most of my people. And I said, maybe the things you might not know is about how much money I have in the bank. And as of today, this date, this is what my account reads like. Uh, you are indicated as my next of kin. Whatever happens, my son should continue to go to the very best school in life. You know, the things, you know, that we worry about as people. And so I think my mother decided not to divulge that information to my father, who's more hypertensive. But later, when I recovered, we had to have that conversation, like, seriously. Mommy, if I died, I know for certain where I'm going, but I don't know about you. And I can assure you that at the end of the second wave, by the time we were done, I think for me that was the greatest miracle that God made apart from healing me was that my mother got born again. I, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And God works in amazing ways. So that's the other thing about the connection with people, but also and connection with people, but also preparing your people about life when you're gone. But then also the other thing related to that is make the things that you have been embarrassed about known. From where I sit as a counselor, because I do some counseling over the weekends, 
Where I sit as a counselor, I interface with many people who find it easy to come and tell me things that they have not shared with anyone else. Things like I'm a married man, I'm a married woman, I have three children with my husband, but I had two children before I officially got married from another relationship, and my husband does not know about these children. Are we together? And then it's a question of when were you hoping to tell him? And she, she will tell you I was never hoping to tell him, but I feel it so you know, deep on my heart to be able to reveal. Or the guy tells you, oh, during marriage, I, I strayed a bit and I have some three chaps somewhere, you know? And for me, those are things that if you value me as a partner, as a spouse, I need to know. Because when you're lying in your casket and three babies that usually turn out to be a copy-paste shrink of you walk into the door, my perception of you at that point changes. Are we together? It changes. Of There's a way God does these things. These babies usually come out looking a certain way where you cannot deny. And yet, maybe if you had made it clear, you would say your apologies and all of that, maybe the perception would have been different. But also speaking from, from a perspective of someone who works in the children's sector, we talk about identity. We talk about belonging. These are fundamental rights for any human being. Where does that leave the child who knows they have a father somewhere, but they don't interact with them? Where does it leave a child who knows they have some siblings somewhere, but they don't even know what they look like? Where does that leave a child who knows they have a mother who abandoned them when they were three months old? You get what I'm saying? And what does it say to them the time when they become parents themselves, how are they going to deal with those issues? Because psychologically, these things don't just vanish. They come back to haunt, to haunt these people, but also for the people that commit these crimes. I'll call them crimes. Or make the, the people who make these mistakes. Yeah. It's okay to own up. It's okay to own up. I have seen girls, they have aborted left, right, and center. Then they come to confess. And I don't even know how to deal with that. And they say, I have failed to get a child, but I had seven abortions. And I don't know how, I'm not medical. I'm a psychologist. I don't know how to deal with that. Are we together? And yet, you're saying this, you're four years into a marriage. Your current partner never got wind of this at all. Maybe if he had, he would have known what to expect and what not to expect, or even support you uh, in walking this journey. So, the things that we are ashamed of, it's okay to say them out, because th then we are able to get the support that we need. But then also, finally, is to plan uh, for support mechanisms for your loved ones when you are gone. I know many of us here look like we are students, are we? Yes. What are the support mechanisms you can put in place for your mother? Do you know as a parent, I don't think there's anything more painful than losing a child. And it doesn't matter what age. But I think at your age, you guys, oh my goodness, how does a parent recover from that? So if something happened to you and you had to go, what does your parent hold on to? Do they hold on to the fact that I know Helen is gone, but I know she's in a better place. I know she's in the hands of her creator. I think knowing that alone for a grieving parent makes the pain less. Rather than saying, Helen is gone, but really, Lord, take your child. You know, you, I have been a steward. I did everything humanly possible. I still failed. Let her rest in peace. You know, those kinds of things. So how the way you carry yourself, the things that you stand for as a person, the things that you believe in, your own behavior impacts on the way you relate with other people. That's something for us to think about even post our existence. Thank you so much, Helen. Can we appreciate her, please? <laughs> if you're seated next to a married person, ask them, does your spouse know the bank balance on your account? <laughs> okay. Wow. Helen, as we close, yes. 
when we talk about these things, some students will think like you mentioned, it's for 80 year olds. Mm. But at this stage in life, mm. as a campus student, as a university student, right. why is it important to do things right, even as we prepare for the future? So first of all, uh, university gives us, I think it's like the epitome of our grounding in terms of education. And so how we finish this education race, which is what happens here, matters. When I sit on interview panels, you can tell someone who was a joker in class. You know, with experience, you get to learn these things. You can tell someone who took things seriously. You can tell so much within the five minutes or 10 or 30 minutes conversation that you have with someone on a panel. So, as we come to the end of this journey of education, it is important that we finish well. That's first and foremost. That's the main purpose for being here. Finish well. When we are doing interviews, where, when you're shortlisting people, someone with a past degree, if you have 20 first classes, you'll not even look at a what? At a past degree. It is what it is. So, finish and finish well, that's the first thing. But also, finish well educationally, but also finish well as a person. Because this is a phase where you're transitioning into like full-blown adulthood, independence, and all of that. So the things that we do at this stage really matter. The things that we do, the things we stand for, the things we take seriously or unseriously really, really matter while here. When we go to, you know, places of work, for example, you find a child who cannot write even a letter. And they have spent, how many years do we spend in school? 13. 13? Something like that. Yeah. 13, 16? Almost 20 years, and you can't write a letter. You know? And I know even as I say this, it's it's telling of our education system, but it's also telling about you as a person. By the time you're at university, you need to be finding spaces to practice and learn. You don't have to wait for the, the very final year after you have graduated to find pl a place to do internship. Are we together? Get into these spaces early. I, st I volunteered for three, for four years. Uh, three years before graduation and then an extra year after I graduated. And I can tell you, I do not understand to this day how people want to leave university today and expect to get a job tomorrow, a paying job. And they want to earn two million shillings. You have not earned it. You haven't. Are we together? So your being here should give you, because it allows you also a bit of time when you break off, to go and, you know, equip yourself more for the field that you want to get into. So utilize that time. Use those opportunities. When you get into the space of work, it is difficult to even find that odd two hours to do an online uh, lesson. Are we together? I keep saying that adult learning is not impossible, but it is difficult. Why? Because the demands for your time are very many. Are we together? So as we are here, let's utilize that time to do that. But also the other thing is, let's ground ourselves. If you're going to be a thief tomorrow, you will have started by now. Can you hold on to your phone, Titan? <laughs> are we together? This is a phase where you are now is a a, a platform for consolidating who you really are. If, if you are going to be the kind of person who wants to build a mansion worth 300 million shillings in the first year of work, for me, that tells me you're going to be a thief. Actually, you already are a thief. Why? Because it's not realistic. God gives us a natural way of growing things. Are we together? that you work, you progressively achieve the things that you achieve. If I was entrusted with 50 million at the time to go and do the trainings and all of the things that I used to do, 
depending on the things that I had eventually uh, chosen to stand for as a person, I could have bagged, let's say, 30 million of the 50 and accounted for 50. And nobody would have questioned me. But the consolidation of the moral fabric here determines how you act there. Are we together, colleagues? Are we together? So it matters that, you know, if you're the kind of person who is in the business of Xeroxing, Coursworks, those are small, small things that eventually catch up with you. Because me, that side, I will wait to get a report at a certain point, and it's only you who has to produce that report. There's no one to Xerox it from. Even if you Xerox it, I will know that, no, this is Lydia's writing style. It can't be that Lydia and Helen write exactly the same way. And so you get caught there when it's a bit late, and nobody has the time in that space. Guys, life is brutal. The world out there is brutal. Nobody has the time to start dealing with issues of morals at that stage. When you're caught, what happens? You go. Because you sowed seeds and now they are maturing and they are fruiting. They have, you have to go. And then finally, of course, is the is the issue around our personal behavior. Many people get children, maybe a little past this stage, some during this stage, some maybe came with children hidden somewhere, but you know, masquerade as though, as though they have none, and all of these things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, whatever you do, let not the, the failure or prosperity of a child who's being here you are responsible for get in the way of your blessing. Because God is a just God. Are we together? Our God is a God of justice. If my son is languishing somewhere and I am here driving around, you know, being taken as a technical advisor, doing consultancies here and there, but I fail to provide, I, I fail to acknowledge, I fail to build the esteem of that young man, it is a matter of time before it catches up with me. So as a student, look through your own life. If there are things that you're not happy about, not proud of, it's unfortunate, but here you are. You can't undo them. Maybe some you can undo. Those that you can't undo, acknowledge and make them known. Somebody will walk this journey with you. And you can identify the person to walk the journey with you. But most importantly, prepare yourself for a brutal life out there. That I assure you. And your, your, your foundation in God is going to come in very, 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 very handy. From the carpet interviews, you've heard about those things. Hmm? You've heard about carpet interviews? People like to, you know, men, with all due respect, I'm sure those are men outside of this hall and outside of this university. But you have had men who say, no, you have to sleep with me to get a job. That is a test of what you stand for. Are we together? If you're not grounded, it's very easy to sleep with that guy because you know my mother depends on me. He's going to give me 300,000 shillings. But if you're grounded, you'll be like, it's okay. I will take another year before I get a job. So things like that. People will give you kituki dogo because you sit behind a desk. Things like that. People will tell you, no, you pass this procurement thing. Once we get the deal, I assure you, over 30% cut. Things like that. You're not looking for them. They come looking for you. So consolidate your morals, consolidate your beliefs, consolidate your faith, consolidate who you are as a person, what your true identity is, which I hope is in Christ, and the rest will be easier to handle with. I thank you. Thank you so, so much, Helen, for sharing your life and for sharing with us. Amen. Let us appreciate her one more time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. We want to close. I'm going to ask you to stand up and we pray together. But before you go, find one person and share the one thing you are taking out of this hall. We have talked about foundations. It matters what foundation you lay for your life, and it impacts a lot on what you leave behind when.